Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ann Harkey, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on our latest NASA software catalog. Our presenter today is Dwayne Armstrong. Dwayne Armstrong is the Chief of the Advanced Technology and Technology Transfer Branch at NASA Sinus Space Center in Hancock County, Mississippi. An electrical engineer graduate of Mississippi State University, he's worked for NASA for 35 years. As part of his current role, Dwayne and his team ensure that technologies developed for NASA missions are broadly available to the public, maximizing the benefit to the nation. He was a leader in the development of this software catalog, which makes finding and downloading NASA software easier and faster than ever before. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll answer those during the Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'm gonna throw it over to you, Dwayne. Uh, as Ann said, um, my name is Dwayne Armstrong, and I'm happy to give you an update on our uh, the release of our 2021-2022 NASA software catalog. So you may not realize this, but uh, NASA generates a lot of software. About a third of all of the agency's intellectual property, the new inventions that we create every year are software. And it's our intention to try to maximize the use of these tools by sharing them as broadly as possible with industry and academia and other government agencies uh, to help people take advantage of the, uh, the work that's been done, the investments that have been made and the creativity that's been realized. But before NASA realize, uh, releases software, uh, the developers have to show that it's up to the snuff of being something that we want to release. So they've got to show that it will meet NASA's engineering standards. It's got to go through reviews to make sure that it passes through our export control and restrictions on software uh, regarding uh, foreign national access. And that, their, uh, that NASA actually has appropriate ownership rights that would allow us to release the software to you. If it passes through all of those uh, uh, reviews, then the software is actually assigned a release category. It de determines its level of availability to the public and other users. It ranges from open source, which is the, the broadest release category, all the way to government purpose release, which is the most restrictive. We then publish the codes on software.nasa.gov, which is the federal government's only software inventory portal. And then we try to raise awareness about the contents of that catalog, both internally to NASA and to other potential users so, so that people can uh, best utilize the software that's been developed. And we're dedicated to making this process as easy for you as we can. So we're constantly making efforts to streamline the process, to make it a little bit easier to navigate through the system and faster to receive the, uh, the codes you're approved to download. So previously, the security vetting process could take, could take a long time, could take weeks to complete. Now we've very much uh, streamlined and revamped this process with an automated download request system where we've cut the time that it takes to do that, prevent, uh, that security vetting process significantly in many times as little as one day, uh, but typically uh, just a couple of days in order for us to make a determination. And when you're navigating through this software catalog and you find something that uh, looks interesting to you, it's important that you understand the different types of software release types uh, that we have. So currently the catalog has over 800 software programs that are available for download and they're available in the following release categories. So open source release, I think many people will be familiar with. It's, uh, it has the fewest restrictions and it's for collaborative efforts in which programmers improve upon the codes that were originally developed by NASA, but were shared uh, with the broader community. General public release is for codes with a broad release and no non-disclosure or export control restrictions. U.S. and foreign release is for codes that are available to U.S. persons and persons outside of the U.S. who meet a few uh, export, control, export control restrictions. U.S. only release is for software that's only available to U.S. persons. And U.S. government purpose release is for software that can only be used by organizations that are have a contract or an agreement with the U.S. government 
and uh, uh, are required to have access to that software in order to complete that work. We have uh, uh, many pieces of software in the catalog. As I said, over 800. Here are the, the top 10 that are the most requested. And this is pretty much uh, consistent year after year. Uh, so, and you'll see that this spans a, a variety of different types of tools from very technical tools like the Tetris CFD software that tops the list uh, all the way through uh, visualization tools, uh, or, uh, orbital planning and de uh, debris management tools, uh, even cost estimation tools. So there's many different types of categories of software in the, uh, in the catalog. There's 15 types in, uh, in actuality including some uh, types of software that are used by NASA for their Mars projects. So examples of codes that are used by Perseverance and Curiosity uh, includes the ones below, such as the Mars Global Reference Atmospheric Model. Uh, so if you're going to try to land something on Mars, it's very important that you understand the characteristics of the atmosphere and how your system might interact with them. Uh, and so the, the Mars Gram system can help with that. The Space Mission Architecture and Risk Analysis Tool, SMART, is, as it says, it's a tool that's used to help uh, determine and manage the risk that are evolved and are tracked during a, a, a space program. But NASA has more than just technical tools and software tools and tools for building satellites. Uh, we also have tools to boost productivity or to help with education. So uh, one is example of a game is to the moon and beyond. So it's uh, a game that helps uh, teach about how the International Space Station uh, works and how research is conducted there and uh, how you can uh, make determinations about how you want to manage your budget to maximize your research return. Uh, another example of an education uh, tool is the Space Science Investigations Plant Growth Tool. It's an interactive app that uh, teaches about growing plants in space. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting that uh, it's uh, now that we've been growing plants on the space station for a while, but it's uh, only recently that we've let the astronauts actually eat them. So uh, uh, there's much to learn about how plants grow and behave in space. And then sort of an example of a typical productivity tool is the project cost estimating capability uh, tool. And obviously with the number and type and variety of projects that NASA undertakes, everything from very modest activities to you know, enormous projects that span years and years and years, uh, being able to have a tool that provides a reasonable way of uh, estimating cost with, uh, especially with the limited information that's available in the early phases of projects is something that's very useful to have. We also have the remote sensing toolkit. So if NASA collects a tremendous amount of data about the earth, and we also build a, a, a large number of software tools to work with that data to help people visualize it and analyze it. And we also have uh, other tools that you might want to use to build your own tools for working with that data. So the Remote Sensing Toolkit is this front end to help you navigate through all of those processes, which could be somewhat uh, challenging otherwise. So it will help, you can go into the Remote Sensing Toolkit and search for the types of data that you're looking for. You can go in and find tools that are ready-made to work with that kind of data, or you can search for uh, tools or APIs or other types of interfaces that you can use to build your own tools to work with that data. And you can see uh, a webinar that we hosted about the Remote Sensing Toolkit there listed on your screen. So when you're ready to get started, you can go to the NASA software catalog at software.nasa.gov and you, will, you can either search there by keyword, by title, or you can browse through you know, any of the 15 categories that you see listed here to try to find the software or pieces of software that might be useful for you. 
if you find something that you like, you can click on it and you will see a, uh, a write-up that gives you some information about what this software actually does, a brief description about it. Over on the right-hand side, you can see a little bit of information such as the operating systems that it runs on and its release type, which is important to know. And if it's something that you want, then you can just uh, click on the Request Now button. And that will initiate the process uh, for you to, uh, to request the software. If you've never requested software from NASA before, uh, you'll have to create a guest account in order to be able to access this. Uh, but that only takes a few minutes to do. And then when you uh, get sent back to this form, to, uh, so you'll fill out a, a short online form for us to get information about who you are and uh, who you work for, a few things like that. And then you submit the request and we'll do the automated processing that we described before. And typically within a day or two, you'll get an answer about your, uh, your request to receive the software. And when your request is approved, you'll, be, you'll receive an email with a uh, link to allow you to download the software.